Okay, so tonight we're going back to Tehillim, Psalms. We're holding chapter Ayin Dalit 74. So what we'll be doing is, Bezat Hashem, as well, we'll be covering Tehillim for several months. We won't finish the entire book. And then we'll go back and do something else. And eventually we'll complete the, the book. I want to give a brief introduction since it's been a little bit of, it's been a while since we covered Tehillim. What exactly are we doing here by learning about these beautiful praises and prayers that David compiled? In reality, even though we, they're called psalms, praises, they're prayers, very powerful prayers. And the importance of reading them, saying them, learning them, is to make a connection with Hashem. When one prays, Prayer itself forms a bond with God. These words are especially powerful. So when these words are said in prayer, they make for a very powerful bond, a very powerful connection. And the reason for that connection, the reason why we want to have that connection, is because in prayer we are sometimes granted that which would not be granted to us without the prayer. So as our tradition teaches that sometimes things are held back from us just for this purpose alone. Because Hashem wants, Hashem mit'aveh letfilatan shel tzedekim, He wants the righteous, He wants the good people to turn to Him, to depend on Him, to, re to remind themselves of Him, of His presence. So these words especially have tremendous power in them. It's not just an ordinary prayer. This is a prayer that consists of praising Hashem, thanking Hashem, reminding ourselves who Hashem is, that He's the one that's in charge, He's the boss. And when we remind ourselves of these ideas, we are also strengthening our faith. And in the process of strengthening our faith, it becomes a merit for us, a zakhut, a merit that sometimes is needed in order to cancel bad decrees, in order to change our mazal it's not such a good myself. So this prayer, the power of this prayer, is not just to form a connection. Of course, we're forming a connection in a very, very powerful way. But in the end, this may be to our benefit. That in case there's a terrible decree out there, we want to cancel it. This would be one way to do so. Charity is another way. So by saying these words, specifically these words, it could be a tremendous merit for us a time of need. By turning to Hashem, by turning to Creator, what we're saying is, En od vado, there's nobody but you. You're the only one in charge. There are not a lot of religions out there that believe that. They believe in a multitude of gods, or they believe in the God of money. <laughs> they think that that is the one that is going to save them, protect them, help them in life. And many, many times they will see that that's not true. They will be disappointed how money or friends, people who they thought were their friends, did not come out and help them at all. In the end, if they turn to Hashem, they perhaps did see salvation. So when we say, En od mil vado, these words become extremely powerful in such a way that they're able to drive away our enemies. You know, when we say enemies, we we are also talking about the demons, those harmful spirits. And I intentionally talk about that now because we will see that this chapter is somewhat related to that in case one has trouble with certain elements, let's call them, that are giving him a hard time. This chapter could be very powerful to drive them away. So by saying these words, the words of Tehillim, or by even composing our own personal prayer. What we're saying is, En od mil vado, we only turn to you. When we pray, we are reminded that I call kol Yaakov ve'adayim yudei Isav, if you recall, that Yaakov, Jacob, was blessed. And how was he blessed? When Isaac said, wait a minute, I hear the voice of Jacob, but I feel the hands of Esav, because he was hairy. 
But in those words, in the Chak's statement, that something is wrong over here, we were actually seeing the power of Yaakov. And what is that power? The power of speech. The power of Yaakov is in his speech. He's able to pray. That is how he's able to get things done. Whereas Esav, his entire power lies in his hands. He wages war. He lives by the sword. A very, very big difference, a great contrast between two opposing powers in this world. The power of Yaakov, the power of Esav. The Jewish nation and Amalek, which are opposing each other. Very, very different in how they accomplish things. So we are able to accomplish a great deal with our mouth, with our words, with our prayer. We don't need to use our hands. Even though we have to make an effort, we sometimes go to battle. But if we are meritorious, we won't have to use all the weaponry in the world. The verse says, Hashem will fight the wars for you, and you will be silent. You won't have to do anything. So that is the power of speech that the Jewish nation has, if, of course, we use it properly. Tehillim is also a concentration of many praises and prayers for all kinds of situations that may arise in the future. David Melech anticipated a lot of this is pretty much prophecy about what is going to happen in the future. He went through all kinds of terrible experiences, painful experiences, the likes that we should never know of. But nonetheless, he put it all together in the book for us not to lose hope and to realize that everything is controlled from above, things can change, we should not despair, and we should turn to this book and say those prayers that are specific for certain types of situations that may arise. In Tehillim, we're also taught many, many important, valuable hashkafot, the right perspective. When things do not appear to us right, when things are seemingly wrong, that the wicked are prospering and the righteous are suffering, he helps us understand what this is all about. Even though we can never understand why Hashem does certain things, but through Tehillim, and David went through this kind of situation, he explains to us that this is all orchestrated from above, that there is a reason for everything. So as we say these words, as we pray to Hashem in, from this book, we are also acquiring an, in, a lot of clarity in certain areas that appear to be very, very vague. And this can help us very much. And last but not least, Tehillim is very inspirational. It restores hope, and it reminds us that even though things appear to be bleak right now, one day things will turn around, as it did for David Amelech. So it is very powerful medicine for those who are going through a hard time, as long as they understand what they're saying. But even if you don't understand the words, Tehillim has power. The words are very powerful. So even if you do not understand what you're saying, it can definitely make a difference. The more we understand what we're saying, the better, because we can focus better, we can concentrate on our prayers, and of course we can gain a lot by understanding what he's talking about. So we're on to chapter 74, almost pretty much halfway through the book of Tehillim, Ayn Dalit. In this chapter, we have an Asaf. Asaf is one of the prophets. And he was a prophet that complained to Hashem a lot. There were a few prophets like that who had a very difficult time with Midat Adin, with the attribute of justice. The attribute of justice can be very, very tough. And Asaf is, of course, a very caring individual. And even though prophets needed to rebuke, and needed to tell people off, needed to point to the mistakes, nonetheless, he took on the side of his nation, his people, and would turn to Hashem and said, you know, how long does the Galut have to go on for? We're almost 2,000 years in exile. Why so much? Enough. So that is where his focus is, even though many prophets, of course, pray to Hashem. They did, a, they did so from a different angle, with different, type, with a different emphasis. Asaf takes here the position that it doesn't look right. It looks like a Chilul Hashem as well. It looks like, God forbid, the name of Hashem is being desecrated when the enemies appear to be getting away with it. 
because nothing has happened. The temple has been destroyed, and it's been in ruins for so long. And as we're speaking right now, the temple, Mount, the Harabait, is still occupied by something else, another structure that is not the house of Hashem, that used to be. So here he begins to talk a little bit about the Churban. He brings to memory what has happened in the past. In this case, it's for him it's in the future, because all of this is, is going to happen in the future. And he's not only talking about the destruction of the temple, he's talking about the destruction of many, many houses of worship that he sees. He's an Avi, he's a prophet. And he says, how long will this be going on, that so much is destroyed and your name is disrespected? Even though they may have sinned, your, your children may have sinned, but still, they've already paid more than enough for their sins. So, maskil le'asaf, lama Elohim zanachta la'netzach yeshan ha'pecha betzom ha'retecha? The word maskil means to enlighten. Either he says, I'm going to enlighten you with some information that you should know, or he's saying, this is enlightening to himself. That's what the word maskil means. There's a lot to, to gain from this, a lot to learn from these words, what it, exactly we should be expecting, since it appears to be, it only appears to be, that things are not so good. When will this all end? So he says, Why does at least it appear that you have abandoned us forever? It appears like that. We're still scattered everywhere. Your anger or your wrath continues to fume against your sheep. Now, you may have already heard the term sheep associated with the Jewish people. A flock of sheep that is usually being a shepherd. There's a shepherd who's taking care of them, watching over them, guiding them. But sometimes it appears that the sheep are lost. So that is why it's an example of the Jewish people that are scattered with no shepherd to take care of them. It appears like that. Hashem gives the appearance. And that appearance is called a sterpanim, that Hashem has concealed His face. And when Hashem conceals His face, the Torah clearly says, that all kinds of terrible things happen. But it's only a, an appearance, it's not the reality. He'll tell us soon that the reality is that Hashem has never abandoned us. On the contrary, if you want to know the answer to this question, here you don't find the answer to the question. Hashem answers the question in Hosea. You're telling me that I've abandoned them? They've abandoned me! That's what it says in Hosea. If anybody abandoned, it's they abandoned me. And uh, that's uh, very, very sad, because it, that's indeed what has happened throughout history. But th even that is not 100% accurate. And I take the liberty to say that, because all the prophets in the end say, some may have abandoned you, some may have gone their way. But as a whole, the Jewish people are still intact. They still believe in you, at least a great number of them do. They've given their lives for you. So in other words, we can't just say that since some people have left, that means that everybody has left. No, some have left. Some have, unfortunately, as they say in English, fallen between the cracks. It happens for all kinds of reasons. The hope is that even those individuals will come back and do Teshuvah. As the Torah predicts will happen in the future, right before Mashiach comes, there will be a wave of people returning to Hashem. There will be a thirst on a global scale. Even non-Jews will want to come closer and realize that they've been mistaken all along. So that's why he uses here the term "tzomaritecha," your sheep, because it it appears as though these sheep don't have to have any direction. There's no shepherd around. As he's talking about the Jewish people, how they've suffered and how they've been dispersed, and appear to be abandoned, he's also going to be asking about revenge on the non-Jewish world. Who are we talking about specifically? Those who persecuted them. And this is an important idea, not because we are revengeful, but in order to bring out the fact that Hashem has always been around, 
and everything was done for a specific reason, that he has not forgotten who did what, that, every, that there's a day of reckoning, it is important that there should be a measure for measure, it is important that there should be a day of nekama, as it's called, a day of revenge, when the books are balanced, when everything is evened out. And that's what this world is all about. There is a certain uh, need to even things out. They cannot be askewed. They cannot be not in order, not in sync. It's a perfect world. But in the meantime, there's imperfection because man is imperfect. Man causes a short circuit, as I, I like to call it, in Hashem's creation. And there's a need to correct that and to, uh, a need to fix anything that was uh, ruined. And a sin, a transgression, causes a short circuit in a sense, either on an individual level to himself or on a global level or on a national level. So he begins to ask for a hamim. He begins to ask for mercy on the Jewish people. And he says like this, Zechor adadecha kanita kedem ga'alta shevet nachalatecha har tzion zeshachan tabo. So he begins to reminisce. And there will be a lot of description about the past, the past history of the Jewish people, the past relationship. So he says, remember. Does Hashem need to remember? It's very interesting that he uses these words. Who are you talking to? Remember. Rem these words are intended for us more than for anybody else. So when we're saying these words, we're asking Hashem, take into consideration the fact, not that he needs to remember, but that he, it needs to come before his throne. These words, these memories, these facts, and they need to be brought to his attention by us. Not that he would not remember without us, but that's what he wants us to do. When we turn to him, which he wants us to do, we should talk about the beautiful relationship we had once upon a time, how we did have a temple. Remember Hashem? Of course He remembers. But here, we are saying this to ourselves and we're bringing it to His attention because this is what we are saying we want to have again. Oh, you really do? Do you really mean it? Are you sincere about it? Yes. So the Navi, of course, is very sincere. Zechor Adatecha, remember your congregation. Who are these people, the Jewish people? Kanita Kedem. You've acquired them from before, a long time ago. They were yours from a long, long time ago. And the rabbis tell us, the commentaries explain, we even talk about before creation. Because the world was created with this in mind. Hashem designed the world that there should be a nation, Israel, that will take the lead in being a light unto the world, unto the rest of the nations. So here, this concept of Israel existed even before creation. So Kanita Kedem, you've acquired us from a long time ago. Ga'alta, Shevet Nachalatea, you've already redeemed us once upon a time. Remember? It happened in Egypt. Har Tzion Zeshachan Tabo. And this is the place where you resided, this Temple Mount, where there was a temple two times. Harima Pe'amecha Lemashu'ot Netzach Kol Ira'o Yeb HaKodesh. So now, after he's brought this to our attention, and of course to Hashem, he says, if anything should go on for eternity, it's the punishment on those who were your enemies. So, harima peamecha, very poetic words, but you'll see why he uses these words. Lift your steps. <laughs> Hashem doesn't have to lift his feet or anything. So why is he saying lift your steps? So we'll get to that in a moment. But basically he's saying take action. Lemashuot netzach. To bring destruction. Mashuot is desolation, destruction, ruin for eternity. That do for eternity, not the diaspora, not the exile. To whom? To all those who committed evil in the sanctuary. It was the evil that was perpetrated by the enemy. Go bring them the Mashuot. Go bring them eternal ruin. That's where the eternity should be, not in the suffering of the Jewish people. Beautiful words. We would not think of it on our own. But that's what his job is as a prophet. 
is to analyze the situation and say, wait a minute, this is where the focus should be. Not on accusing us, but accusing the perpetrators. Look what they've done. What they've done is a lot worse than what we have done. So you see how he's trying, he's a good, he's a good lawyer. He's, Besides, of course, telling us the future and besides pleading for us, he is a good lawyer. He continues on to say, Hashem, after all, you know, Some of these verses are not simple. They're, they're a little bit difficult, and that's why I need to perhaps elaborate a little bit more. Shagu means, actually, before we go to Shagu, let me explain why we said before, Arima Pe'amecha, that the, the Prophet is saying, raise your steps, or lift your steps. What steps are we talking about? Because to, 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 towards that temple, who would be going three times a year? Your children, during the holidays. Pe'amecha is therefore indirectly insinuating that this is the place where they went and visited, and it's no longer there. So Arima Pe'amech, I know, was bringing that back that situation where we can once again visit you. So that's insinuated in the words, Harima Pe'amecha, lift your steps. Because in the end, who has stopped all of that? Those enemies that were asking you to go after. Sha'agu tzorerecha bekerev mu'adecha, your enemies or your foes, Tzorarecha is not just an enemy, it's those that give you a hard time, that inflict upon you pain, that persecute you. Shagu Tzorarecha Bekerev Mu'adecha. So in your midst, in the midst of all your sanctuaries, your places of worship, places where you meet, they roared and they yelled and they cursed. And Samu Ototamotot, they took it to mean the fact that they won so easily, the fact that certain things went according to their plans, they took that to mean that Hashem was on their side. They don't realize that just because things are working out for you and you're having a, a, an easy time winning, that does not mean at all that you're right. But the Midrash does say that the ones that came to destroy the Beta Midrash hesitated can we really accomplish this feat? And they threw arrows in the opposite direction of the Bet Hamidash, and the wind turned it around and went to the Bet Hamidash, the temple. So you see? Hashem is giving us a sign that we're doing the right thing, that we're going to win, that this is, the structure is going to come down. And unfortunately it did. But they took it to me, that's what he's saying, Samu ototam otot. They really took the omens, they really took those signs from heaven as being something real that they should follow. And they don't realize that eventually they're going to pay for this. Hashem is just using them as a means, as a medium, to accomplish whatever it is that He wants to accomplish. But in the end, the individual who has free will is going to pay for it. But all could have said, I don't want to enslave the Jewish people, or I'm going to enslave them, but I'm, I don't have to abuse them. But all has free will. Later on, of course, Hashem hardens his heart, later on, so that he should not let go, so that he should receive all the punishment. But initially, had Paro not agreed to do this, to, you know, was to go out and enslave the Jews, somebody else could have done it. It doesn't have to be this individual, it could be somebody else. So nobody can ever say, Hashem made me do it. It had to be this way. They, the Jewish people, perhaps deserved it, to be in bondage, but it doesn't have to be in your country, it doesn't have to be you that are going to be behind it, it could be someone else. As the Torah talks about putting up a guardrail, for example, a fire pit, why? Why should you put up a guardrail? Because we don't want anybody falling off. So the Torah uses a language so that the one that will fall should not fall. One that will fall? Who says he's going to fall? Yes, somebody is going to fall, but why should it be in your house? Why should you be the one? 
be careful when you're driving a car. Somebody may have to, unfortunately, get hurt. But why should it be you that hits him? You watch out. Be careful. So they took the signs that they were seeing to be that Hashem not only approves of it, He's happy with it, and he, He's not going to punish them. So they use this as a way of going after the Jewish people with greater ferocity, with, with sha'agu, with, with crying out, with calling out, with pride, in, in a very disrespectful way. This is what they've done, otherwise they celebrated pretty much what they were doing. He <coughs> goes on to explain what a shame. Look at the difference between what things looked like once upon a time and what they appear to be now. Once upon a time, it would be that those that came with a whole bunch of wood and axes to chop the wood, came with the intent to donate this wood to build the Bet HaMikdash. Yivada kimevi lemala, you know, was let it be known, they were considered once upon a time as an offering for Shemaim. Those woods that were brought to contribute towards the building of the temple. But ve'ata pitukhea yachad bechashil vechilapot yahalomun. But now, all of the ornaments, all of the designs, all of the beauty in the temple, unfortunately now, are being destroyed by kashil and chilapot, by hammers and hatchets, all kinds of instruments that are used in construction. So look at the difference between how the wood was treated back then, in the very beginning, it went towards the construction, and the axes and the, the tools that were used were to fashion these things out to make a temple and now everything is being destroyed and these enemies of yours they were not satisfied with just destroying the temple they actually burnt it down and you can see it even today if you went to the archaeological park next to the western wall you still will see some remnants of the first temple and you will see stones that are blackened from the fire that roared then. Yeah, it was even after the fact, after the rocks came tumbling down, because they were destroying the, the temple, they laid waste to it. They put it on fire. So you can see signs of that on some of the rocks till today. So, Hilelu Mishkan Shem as we said earlier, this is what they've done. They've desecrated your name. They've desecrated your place. So what is he doing now? He's saying, focus Hashem on the fact that this is still the way it is. Nothing has been done to restore that temple. There's still a Chilul Hashem, a desecration of your name, because all over the world, they are still upset at the Jews. And the Jews don't understand why. <laughs> And they just say, oh, it's anti-Semitism. No, no, no. There's still that enmity in the air, which is incredible. And in some ways, I've explained that Hashem is doing that intentionally, allowing it to raise its ugly face again, to remind us that the same perpetrators back then are still around, either in a reincarnation or the same attitudes that existed then are still around today because the problems still exist today amongst the Jewish people. So Hashem uses these individuals for two reasons. Reason number one, to remind us that we are not yet meritorious enough to be redeemed, unfortunately. We haven't done enough to get out of exile. And number two, to remind us, you see these people? These are the great-grandchildren. These are the descendants of the original enemies. And they're the same. Don't be mistaken and think that they've disappeared, those uncivilized barbarians. No, they're still around. And all you have to do is go back 75 years to the Holocaust. That's not a long time ago. And you had what appeared to be a very civilized nation, Germany, commit such atrocities that, that were never heard of. How could this be? Yeah, because things have not changed. 
and that is why he goes on to explain in the next pasuk, Amru belibam minam yachat sarfu kol el ba'aretz. This is a very interesting verse. It could have two interpretations. Amru, they said to themselves, the rulers, according to one interpretation, the word minam means the rulers, thought to themselves, they said in their heart, together, sarfu kol el ba'aretz. We've finished them off. Everything is destroyed. All the places worship, the meeting places are gone. In other words, they will never come back to Israel. There will never be Torah in Israel, Chaz Shalom. There will never be worship of Hashem. No. Things are coming back as the prophets have predicted. The land is being settled again. The children are coming home. Everything is being rebuilt. But at one point, that is what they thought. That is what they said confidently that they finished it up, they finished the job, and there's no more chance that they're coming back. Or you can say Ninam. Ninam referring to Ninim, the descendants of the Jewish people, that perhaps they will observe and they will say, wow, there's no going back. Everything is so desolate. I mean, that was over 100 years ago. You could still see that, how things were not looking good in Israel. It was abandoned, as Mark Twain describes when he was there in the late 1800s. So, And why should they feel down, the Jewish people? They feel down because For good reason they feel down. They feel down meaning that they are a little bit discouraged when they see things are, are the way they are because they no longer see signs as they did in the past, open miracles as they saw in the past. We have not seen our signs. We don't have a prophet. We don't have anybody telling us what to expect next. And that's true. Generation after generation, it becomes less and less clear to us because we don't have the great leaders that we had once upon a time. What do we have to go by? The prophets. Thank God we have the prophets. The prophets point out that this is what you should be expecting. So if I would be telling you 150 years ago, very, very soon, you see the prophet here says that there will be children playing on the streets of Jerusalem once again. And the elderly, you know, walking with their cane in the streets of Jerusalem. He would say, yeah, maybe my great-grandchildren will see it. You know, you would be disbelieving of it. You just go today and see what's going on in the streets of Jerusalem. There's even pizza shops there. <laughs> anyway, but at, at some point, a Jew who is especially being persecuted, he may have been thrown in the dungeon, especially during the Middle Ages. I mean, in Europe, there, there were terrible situations that they, they suffered through during the Inquisition, during the Crusades. We don't see any signs anymore. We don't know what's going on. We have no prophet. He goes on to say, so how long can this last? How long, will, oh God, will the adversary, the enemy, disgrace, continue to disgrace your name, blaspheme your name forever? Till when will this go on? Who is he talking about over here today? Anybody who doesn't believe in God, and there is more and more heresy today than there was in the past. But even in the past, when Christianity emerged as a religion and Islam emerged as a religion, they still persecuted the Jews. They wanted to convert them, to get them up, to be like them. So, in a sense, what they were saying is that, that we are wrong, that our mission is not real. It's, the, it's fake, according to them, it's, or it's been changed. That's what they claim. So that is also, in a certain way, a form of Yina'etz Oyev Shimcha, that he's blaspheming your name. He's saying that the Torah is perhaps something that was formulated by a committee, by human beings, not by Hashem. But we know that's not true. On the contrary. Why did Christianity and Islam both agree that Moshe was a real prophet? They just claimed that Muhammad was another prophet. And there were other prophets, perhaps, 
that God spoke again and introduced this and that. But to tell us that, you know, we're not right is a form of blasphemy. The Navi goes on to explain over here that Hashem has two hands. Not that he really has physical hands, but there is the hand of mercy, the right hand, and there's the left hand of din, of justice. Hashem, why don't you use those hands? On the one hand, the, the right hand is the hand of rahamim, of chesed. Use that to redeem us, or at the very least, your left hand to punish the perpetrators, to punish the, the criminals, the evildoers. Therefore, take out your hand from your bosom, from your chek, from inside. In other words, don't keep it back. Bring it out. In other words, let's see some action. Either from this hand or from that hand. Hopefully with both hands. Why should it be that you're holding back and you are being inactive, not getting involved? So why do you withdraw your hand? That's what the Navi is saying here. And that also, also leads to many people complaining, where was God in the Holocaust? Why didn't we see him do something? Why isn't there any action on his part? Even though we know there is, but it's not open, it's not revealed. Once upon a time, and he's going to explain that next, it was so revealed. Remember the splitting of the Red Sea? Not in Universal Studios. A real splitting of the Red Sea. It happened. Open miracle. If you were there, you could see it. You wouldn't deny it. Today, any miracle that people do see and witness, oh, it's an act of nature. So, why withdraw your hand? In this case, your hand, perhaps your left, and your right hand. Bring them out. So, he says, God is my king from long ago. He used to perform salvations in the midst of the earth, in other words, all over the place. Especially if you go back to the first temple era, there were open miracles, you can clearly see them. In the second temple era, there was less. And as time progressed, less and less and less, there were open miracles. We have prophecy. No, we don't have prophecy yet, not at least in the same level that we had then. People are divinely inspired through HaKodesh, yes, to some extent. So we see a certain Yeridah a certain degrading of the spiritual level of the generation, and as a result of that, the miracles are not as open and not as revealed. And if they were, it would help people. Even though, whenever I talk about miracles, I remind people that don't think that a miracle will make people believe. Because if you want to believe, you don't need a miracle. If you don't want to believe, a miracle won't help. So it really depends on if the individual wants to. And that's a problem. Not everybody wants to. But miracles at least would strengthen those of us who do believe already in reminding us, oh, you see, Hashem never did it, abandon us. Look at, the, look at this miracle that we just witnessed. Look at this, look at that. There are many, many examples of miracles that people can testify to that we in our own generation, our own times, have seen in the various wars that Israel has had and perhaps in your own personal life. So now in, in describing the, the Yeshuot, the many, many salvations, the many miracles that Hashem has done in the past, he brings back, he, bring, he quotes what Hashem has done in Egypt. And he does it in a very interesting way. You divided the sea, that we understand. And you did so with tremendous might, because a miracle of that nature requires a lot of might. What kind of might? When we talk about might, we, we have to recall the fact that there was an accusation against the Jewish people. Why perform miracles for them? They, after all, did immerse themselves somewhat in idol worshiping in Egypt, too. So Hashem had to counter that accusation by saying, yeah, but they were not really doing it intentional. They were somewhat compelled or forced to do so. They didn't do it on their own. 
So when we talk about Hashem's might, is that Hashem has to overcome accusations. And, ha- and especially when we're talking about very, very big miracles. And you ask yourself, well, wait, why do we need so many miracles in Egypt and so many big miracles? Egypt was a place where there was a lot of tumah, a lot of impurity, a lot of witchcraft. In order for the holy powers, for the holy force, to overcome these powers, to bring out the Jews, you, you need a certain amount of koach, a certain amount of power, which is uh, something that can, only can come from the Kedusha, from Hashem, from the holiness. It's very difficult to detach yourself from that which is shackling you in the Tumah. If the Tumah of the impurity has taken hold of someone, it's very difficult for him to come out of it. You need a, a, a greater power, and the Kedusha is a greater power than the Tumah. But Hashem has to allow for it, Hashem has to agree. So in order to overcome all these powers, these forces, impure forces, you need a tremendous oz, tremendous strength, might. Because of that particular situation in Egypt. And what happened there? You split the sea, which was itself a big miracle, but also Shibarta Rashetan in Himalamain. You shattered the heads of the Taninim. Taninim are either serpents or whales or someone who translates sea monsters. In other words, big creatures. You shattered their heads. Who is he referring to? Referring to the leaders, to Paron, to those who held them back, who, who gave them a hard time. They didn't want to let go. And they used, they applied witchcraft in all kinds of ways to hold them back. So Hashem had to break their head. Hashem had to basically show them who's the boss. So he's using it, a very poetic description of saying that he broke the heads of the Taninim. Obviously, on a Kabbalistic level, there's a meaning of what Tanin means. And we're not going to get into that, but it does refer, I'll just, all I'll tell you is it does refer to a klipa, to an impure shell. On a Kabbalistic level, every minister, every president, every head of state has a minister in the upper world. And when that minister in the upper world is taken down from his position, then the head of state or the king down here below dies. Or he's removed from power. And there were great Sadiqim, righteous people, who would know, oh, the minister of the Tsar of Russia has just been removed from power. Two, three days later, the, the Tsar was assassinated. And it was, so they knew somehow what was going on in the upper worlds. So Rashi Taninim is not just a, a beautiful way of describing Paro, they, you know, the heads of these monsters. There's something behind this. In other words, don't think that this leader you can just remove so easily. It is Taninim. They're very, very big and powerful. And there have been quite a few examples of such individuals in our history who were very difficult to remove. And some Kabbalists actually got together to try to remove him. You know, they were hurting the Jewish people. I think sometimes they succeeded through the Kabbalah. But it's not easy, because you might get hurt in the process too. He goes on to say, you crushed the heads of the Leviathan. Now he goes on from Taninim to Leviathan, leaving him as food for the nation wandering in the wilderness. Le'am letziyim, tziyim is wilderness, in the desert. So. Here we're talking about the shalal, we're talking about the booty that the Jewish people were able to take from Egypt, a certain amount of gold and other materials. So in order to accomplish that, Hashem first, Ritzatzta, you shattered the head of the Leviathan, which is Paro, the head of that nation. So you have Taninim and you have Leviathan, referring either to the heads, to the ministers, or to the main head, Paro himself. So Hashem had to ritzatz, he had to shatter it. Shattering is a very powerful word. Why not just say break, cut? Very interesting idea. When a nation is shattered, it doesn't really recover so quickly. 
Egypt today is not what it was, not even close to the prestige, to the power it had once upon a time. Once the power is shattered, it becomes poor, it goes down. Look what happened to Spain and Portugal. They were great empires. They're suffering economically today. What happened all of a sudden? I mean, we can talk about the history of, of what went wrong, the corruption perhaps, but that's not enough to explain how almost overnight such a great empire dissolves. So here we're, we're receiving somewhat of a description of what Hashem does sometimes, and that is Ritzatsta. He shatters the heads, he shatters the nation. He goes on to, this, to describe the many miracles that happened later on in the desert, that you split the rock, bringing forth water, fountains, and the brook, the stream. And you've also dried up the mighty streams. What's interesting about this verse is that you have a, two opposites. You have supplying water from a rock. On the other hand, you have ovashta drying up the mighty streams. Why? Why this contrast? Well, obviously those miracles were, were there. You have the water being supplied to the Jewish people in the desert, and you have the Jordan River drying up so that they can walk over. But the contrast here is important because you have Dina and Achavim, in a sense, as we will soon see in the next Pasuk, when he talks about day and night, two opposites. So you have water, which is chesed, which is kindness, mercy. And you have hovashta to dry up, which is a form of din or gevura, which is another attribute of Hashem being applied to bring about this miracle. So it's a miracle. Both are miracles, but from a different attribute, accomplishing different things, completely opposite things. So we see here that Hashem has done two opposite things in the past. Therefore, Hashem, do it now too. Bring the Geula on the one hand, and bring the Kama, the revenge, on the other hand. Right? The two opposites. That's where he's leading. So he goes on to explain, yours is the day, and yours is the night. You establish the moon and the sun. So now he's turning to what we see as a daily occurrence, nature. That even this nature is under your control. You brought this about. And you prepare this from the very beginning. That not, not only that man should be able to rest at night and work during the day, it's not only for those reasons, but also we see here two opposites. You prepare these two opposites for some reason. It is you who've, who have done this. Day, night. You said all the boundaries of the earth. Boundaries of the earth, there's two kinds of boundaries. There's the boundary of where the water ends, the oceans. It has to have a boundary, otherwise it would flood the earth. So you've set up that boundary. And there's also different climates in various continents. All of that, Hashem, you've established for some reason. You wanted this climate to be so, this climate to be a little bit different, that there's some parts of the world that are desert and some parts that are forest, some parts that are inhabited and some parts are not inhabited. You've established certain boundaries in the same way that you've established the boundaries or the seasons of the year. You've created, you've established the summer and the winter, the seasons. So here we're seeing opposites. We're seeing that Hashem established this all along. So He is in control. He is the one that created all of this. And the Goim are not paying attention to this. And that's what the next Pesuk is all about. Look, you can see for yourself that there is a creator, that there is a real boss. He's managing the earth. Zechor zot oyev cheref Adonai ve'am naval ni'atzu shemecha. So remember this, how the enemy hated or reveled the Lord. The Am Naval and a vile nation. Naval is vile, wicked, despicable. Niatsu Shemecha, blasphemed your name. So he turns again to Hashem and says, 
look, they see what's going on, they are aware of you, and still they went after you. How did they go after me? Because they went after your children. The rabbis teach us that whoever goes after Hashem's children, it is as though he's going after Hashem. So you have, you, in other words, in turning to the goyim, you have the gall, in other words, to go against Hashem, knowing that He exists, you see Him in every way possible. Then how could you do this? How could you be so disrespectful? Here he brings in the turtle dove. Remember we spoke about the sheep? Now he brings in the turtle dove, the pigeon. He says, Hashem, please don't let your turtle dove the soul, the spirit of your turtle dove, to be given over to the wild beast. Who's the wild beast? The enemies. They're wild beasts. And who's your turtle dove? The Jewish people. Why compare them to the turtle dove? Why are the Jewish people compared to a turtle dove pigeon? You know why? It's one of the only birds that does not part from its mate forever. Even if its mate died, it doesn't go and marry again. So here you have devotion, loyalty. The Jewish people did not go and turn to another god. They were therefore your Torecha. They were your turtle dove. They were yours all along. They may have sinned, they may have done some things wrong, but they are still yours. They never exchanged you for someone else. Therefore, don't give them over to the wild beasts. Don't forget the life of your poor forever. Who are your poor? The Jewish people. During the time that we are in exile, we're considered poor because we are low. We do not always have equal rights. The Jewish people suffer greatly. Therefore, we're treated as a second class Many, many times they were suffering from taxation and the like, and they had a very hard time economically. And other times they did well, but still, overall, they were suffering. So that's why he describes it as the, the life of your poor. But the reason why he also describes it as the life of the poor is because Hashem is known to be the father of the poor. In the same way that Hashem, you take care of the poor and you think of the poor, you look out for them, you care about them, care about your poor, your children. Now, towards the end of the chapter, he says, look back to the covenant. After all, even if the Jews may have drifted away, they still kept the covenant, they still circumcised themselves, they, they still abide by some of the mitzvot, some of the laws. So, you've promised to them that you will never abandon them. You've made a covenant with them as well. So on the one hand, we have a covenant, which is at the very least is the Brit Milah, the circumcision, but it's obviously more than that. It's a promise to follow the Torah. And Hashem made a covenant that He will never abandon us. So Hashem, look at your covenant. There are many places on earth, dark places that are filled with violence. Well, Hashem, look away from them and look at all the violence in the world. And there's a lot of it, even today. Look at all those dens of violence, dark places on earth. There's a lot of it. So look back at your covenant, what you've promised. And therefore, don't, chas v'shalom, don't allow for these enemies to continue doing what they've done all along. Focus on them, on going after them because their dens are full of violence. Do not turn back a poor man. Don't embarrass him. If he prays to you, don't turn back. Don't turn him down. In the end, they will continue to praise you. It was, even though they may not have too many masim, they may not have too many good deeds, don't turn them down. A dach is a poor man, a nichlam is disgraced. But the commentators explain it, that if you turn him down, in some ways you are embarrassing him. 
So don't turn him down if, in fact, he prays to you and asks for forgiveness, asks for you assistance in any way. Unfortunately, that's what a sin does. A sin creates barriers. And sometimes our prayers are not answered. So here he's telling us, turn to Hashem, and hopefully Hashem will not turn your prayer down. Why? Because Yalilu Shemecha, we will continue to praise you. We will continuously remind ourselves that even if we didn't get what we what we needed, what we asked for, it must be for some good. We will say Gamzul we will still praise you and thank you. So that is what the Navi is here saying is Hashem, don't turn it down because in the end they will always continue to praise you. Kumalaim Riva Rivecha Zachorchel Patchamini Naval Kolayom. He is calling on Hashem to champion Riva to fight for his cause, to champion for his cause. Hashem, this is your cause. You don't want to do it for us, then do it for your sake. Why should your name be so low that everybody will disrespect it and not consider you and say it's an act of nature, that this is not a miracle, that God forbid you don't exist? So, Riva Ribecha, this is your cause that you should be championing. And remember that all the insults, all the shame coming from these people, these perverse people, Naval, all day long. Just look around, how many don't want to follow you? And focus on them. Do it for your sake. In the last Pasuk, Al Tishkach Kol Tzorerecha She'on Kamecha Ole Tamid. Do not forget the voice of your enemies, your adversaries, Tzorerecha, those that persecuted your people, those that destroyed your temple, the uh, She'on, the noise, the tumult, of your opponents always goes up on a regular basis. In other words, everything that we see today is pretty much a repetition of what happened in the past as well. Just the names have changed, that's all it is. So the Navi ends the chapter by saying, don't forget those sorerim in the past, because Shon Kamecha Ole Tamid, it's still going on right now, in different ways, in various forms, and it's still a problem that there's so much violence on the one hand in the world and the holiness is being trampled on. Look at the way the world looks today as far as lack of modesty and perversion and the liberalism that is bringing about completely different <laughs> perspectives about life. I'm not even talking about abortion right now. Just that the whole general outlook of what the world looks like today as a whole. And who's taking Hashem's side? No one except, of course, the Jewish people are still sticking stubbornly to the Torah Mitzvot. At least some of them are. And waiting for the day that Hashem should come out in the open and say, you see, I've always been around. See, here I am. But I've concealed myself, obviously, to enable free will. So when we pray, that's what we're really asking. That is a very powerful prayer that we say several times a day, that we're waiting and looking for that Hashem's name should be sanctified. In other words, Hashem, we, it's not just for us. We're not asking just for us to be redeemed. Some Jews are comfortable today. They, not, may, they may not even be thinking about redemption. Even though that's part of our faith and we need to believe that one day, very, very soon, there will be a complete redemption. The Beit HaMikdash will be restored. The dead will rise. That is all part of the Aymunah. But it's more, it's more important that we focus on what's, what's the ultimate thing. And that is that Hashem's name should be exalted all over the world. That's what we really need to focus on. And that is what Tehillim does. Some of the verses at least reminds us that Hashem has been, all, has been around all the time, has made many, many, many miracles all the time. He's always protected us. Don't forget about this. On the other hand, you know, if things are not right, if things are not going the way you, should, you would like them to go, this is a time to turn to Him. Perhaps we can change things. So there's a lot of lessons, valuable lessons that are being taught here in reminding the average individual that Hashem made a covenant. He keeps His promise. I mean, human beings maybe don't keep the promise, but Hashem keeps His promise. But we, we have to pray and ask for that to happen. Hashem can't do everything Himself. Hashem, bring the Mashiach. Yeah, you can do it. Of course He can do it. But He wants us to be involved in bringing that about. And how's that? Through prayer, through good deeds, through mitzvot. 
and what he presents over here in the book of Tehillim are several prayers, not just to thank Hashem and praise Hashem and remind us of the past miracles, but also remind the Jew of his part in bringing this about. You have a responsibility and you can do it. It's not just the prophet. Pray like, like I did and turn to Hashem and you will see without Hashem tremendous miracles very soon. Mm -hmm. All right. In case you didn't catch it in the beginning, I was saying that the segula of this pedic, you know, was a special powers that this uh, chapter has 74 is to drive away any enemies that are accosting you. It was giving you a hard time. And when we talk about enemies, we meant also demons. Ruchot, bad spirits. There are several similar chapters that are powerful in this respect, that they help us get rid of all kinds of enemies. There are many, many harmful elements, as I call them, out there, including demons and people who, whose house is haunted or any kind of spirit that is really harmful. This particular chapter can be helpful. There may be other things that he can do as well. There may be other prayers that he can say as well. But that's what a segula means. A segula means a special power that certain chapters have. This one is for getting rid of those enemies that are tormenting us, that are giving us a hard time, that don't seem to go away. And some of them could be all kinds of forces out there, impure forces, that somehow we got involved or we attracted them by mistake. Either way, it is possible to get some assistance from the Kedusha, from the powers of holiness. So Tehillim has some of that power, that if it's said properly, as long as, of course, we're pure and we don't do anything else wrong, uh, in lieu of an amulet, there's other things that we can do. Saying these words can be very, very helpful.